One of the most common attacks I get from people on the other side is you're just a cartoonist. I think I'll listen to a scientist or a doctor rather than a cartoonist. Um, which is interesting because obviously I'm not just a cartoonist. You know, I'm, I'm a person who's had experiences and thought about this stuff. I'm a parent, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a son. Um, very weird, this thing that was established early on where if you're not a scientist, not just a scientist, but unless you're a virologist or an epidemiologist, you can't have an opinion on this. You can't possibly know whether this is right or wrong. Extraordinary idea to put out. So many people still seem to stick to that. And, it, and, and you think, well, what we're dealing with here, this situation goes way beyond science, or health or, or medicine or statistics. This encompasses everything. This, this is, the, you know, the huge questions about humanity, who we are, where are we going, what's the point of life? Every single human being on the planet has a right to an opinion on this. The only qualification you need is to have lived and to have experiences, you know, that's, that's it. And I think as, we, as we've seen, in many ways the last people who should be telling us what we ought to do are the scientists, are the, the data obsessed writers of algorithms who, who you know, pull graphs out of their backsides and, and tell everyone to stay at home. Um, they've made it very clear that most of them have no idea what life's all about, what love means, or how, how we should balance risk. I'm Bob Moran, I'm a cartoonist and illustrator and um, I worked for The Telegraph as their political cartoonist for 10 years um, and I'm now freelance. So I um, realised when I was quite young that I wanted to be a political cartoonist for a newspaper um, and it was a, an instinctive feeling that I uh, I wasn't necessarily anti-authority, but I realised that I had a problem with people in authority imposing rules that I didn't agree with or that didn't make sense or that were counterproductive, hypocritical. Um, I spent most of my time at school drawing cartoons of the teachers and um, my fellow pupils and getting into quite a lot of trouble for it, actually. Um, I went to university and did illustration for my degree uh, I managed to find more or less the only course in the country where they would allow you to do political stuff. And after university, spent a few years working in uh, hotels and bars and doing work on the side, cartoons, editorial um, satire to send to magazines and newspapers and, and not really getting very far. And then I had a break in 2010 when the Guardian um, cartoonists were off on holiday and they let a few of us come in and cover for them for a few weeks. So I did that, really enjoyed it. And the following year, uh, a job came up at the Telegraph. And so in 2011, I started working full time as a political cartoonist at the Telegraph. And um, that's it really, I did that for 10 years and built up a rapport with the readership and um, became quite successful. Um, now I'm embarking on a, on a new chapter of my career um, where I'm more or less working for myself. It's interesting, I mean, when you work for a newspaper as a cartoonist, you, uh, it's certainly the way it works at The Telegraph, particularly. Um, it's not the same at every newspaper, but it's very much collaborative with the editors. So you are primarily drawing for the readership. So your job is to interpret what's going on in the news. What do people care about? What do telegraph readers think about this? And you liaise with the editors and you say, this is what I think I'm going to cover. This is what I'm going to say about it. And you, you check that they agree. And um, often they do. You submit ideas. Sometimes they'll say, that's great, go ahead. Sometimes they'll want to tweak it. Sometimes they might say, 
uh, we've had enough of that this week or, or um, we want to do something else or maybe there's something you don't know about that's going to be a splash the following day so let's, they'll say actually this is happening today try and think about this um, the longer you do it for the more freedom you are given because they trust you and you've you've kind of proven yourself and you 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 cover the news cycle so many times that certain things come up again and they know that you know how to cover it um with the current situation we're in it's it was interesting because for the first six months i had an awful lot of freedom um in terms of the ideas i was putting in and what i was allowed to say um and often it was running against the grain in terms of what else was in the paper and what else was on those comment pages. I made it clear early on and the editors were aware that I was against what was happening completely, primarily on moral grounds. And that was something they were supportive of and said, you know, that's, um, we're happy for you to pursue that. Um, by sort of October, I'd say, um, 2020, I was doing some really quite harsh comments, things that I was submitting. I thought they're never going to accept this and, and, and they were, um, which was great. And then for whatever reason, um, uh, that changed and I was getting a lot of pushback, um, became more difficult so that little glimmer of freedom suddenly disappeared um, and it got harder and harder to say what I felt needed to be said. We have a very long tradition in this country of political cartooning and on the one hand um, it's, it's a very niche thing to do as a career and, it, and it's quite a small weird little pocket of journalism uh, but it is journalism cartoonists are working as journalists they're just using images instead of words or, or as well as words um, all journalists have a duty and should be motivated to hold power to account that's that's the main thing journalism is there for um, people who obtain power, elective representatives or dictators or anybody, are prone to overreach. They're prone to think too much of themselves. They're prone to gain enormous egos. And journalists, jo a journalist's job is to just try and take them down a peg or two. You know, when they start to get a bit too big for their boots, to remind them that actually you're not beyond reproach, you, you can be criticised, um, you can be laughed at, we're not taking you as seriously as you appear to take yourself. And cartoons have a particular power to do that. It's something to do with that space in the newspaper, um, the medium, the history of the art form that allows a cartoonist to go that much further, to be that much more savage, more aggressive in a clever way, a bit like a court jester. You're permitted to go that extra mile to say things that a journalist writing a comment piece wouldn't get away with because you're creating an image. So there's that subtlety. Um, you don't have to be so explicit, but your readership know exactly what you're saying. Now, one of the things that's baffled me is that I mean, I know all the other cartoonists in the UK and we, we kind of, we would go out drinking together. I got to know them when I was quite young before I ever got a job at a paper. And we all have that awareness that, that our job is to call these people out and to point out the hypocrisy and to say, no, you've gone too far there or you've made this speech but we're reading between the lines and we're, that's what we're going to put in our cartoon. We're going to tell the electorate what you're actually saying. We're going to warn them about where you're actually going here. And when all of this began, when the, um, the, the lockdown was brought in and, and all of the rhetoric began to do with the virus, 
and, and all the propaganda started to come out. Instinctively, I was against it, and I thought my duty as a cartoonist is to say, this doesn't make any sense, this isn't your place. Governments can't do these things, you know, slow down. And I fully expected that all of my fellow cartoonists would be with me. And it was this, this really weird sensation where you're, you're charging into battle and you turn around and there are a few of them who are just staying put with their hands in their pockets, sort of saying, I don't think I'll get involved in this. But then the majority of them, you suddenly realize are charging towards you on the side of the government, churning out extra propaganda. Um, I still, I still can't understand why that's happened. You know, I, I didn't intentionally set out to be a contrarian, to oh, I'm going to take the other side, and I'm going to set myself apart. I fully expected that everyone in my trade would be saying the same thing and taking the same line, because as far as I'm concerned, it's a total betrayal of our art form, of what we're supposed to be doing. The fact that so many of them have gone along with the government line on this. The power of political cartoons, cartoons generally, is that you're condensing a message into, if you do it well, into an image that can be read very, very quickly. The impact is almost instantaneous. Um, a good newspaper cartoon has to do that because the first time you see somebody reading a newspaper and you know your cartoon's in there, you realise just how short a time they spend looking at it. So you have two or three seconds to get that message across. So the first time it happens, it's incredibly upsetting and you want to... I remember being next to someone on a train who was looking at my cartoon and they, they chuckled and then they just moved on to read Charles Moore's column or something. And I, I felt like saying, I spent six hours on that yesterday. Come on, look at it again. Look at the detail in the corner there. Um, but, but that is their power, that, that impact that you can condense so much um, philosophy and emotion into a single image. Um, and I work traditionally as well, I work by hand, I don't do my stuff on computers for a similar reason because I think that immediacy, that connection enables me to inject that soul and emotion into my work which I think if I put a computer in between it might work but not as well um, and it's harder to argue with an image it just is you know the this is another thing about uh, Twitter if I put a thread on Twitter I'll get hundreds and hundreds of replies and half of them will be arguing with the points I'm making. If I put a cartoon on Twitter, very few people actually try and argue with it because you're arguing with a picture. You look like an idiot. And um, that's why it's a valuable weapon, I think. Journalism more broadly um, has been appalling and, and failed in that duty as well. And the thing that's frustrated me the most, you know, even, I mean, to be fair, the Telegraph has been a lot better than other newspapers. They, there, there are journalists there who've tried to put across the other side of the argument, who've done some digging. Um, they've had some really good comment pieces talking about the harms of lockdown and the fact that it's... Um, morally questionable but they won't go far enough and they do this thing where they'll try and frame it as a kind of moral conundrum as if all well, the government's in an extremely difficult position no on most of this there's nothing difficult about it, it it's clear cut what they're doing is completely immoral there's no justification for it and even by saying well um this might be viewed or this might turn out to be the wrong thing or this might, you know, vaccinating children is a, is a moral minefield. It's not a moral minefield at all. It's a moral chasm that you've just plunged headlong into. That's it, you know. And I, and I am so frustrated by the fact that they 
they refuse uh, to be absolute about these things, which should be absolute, in, I think, in a civilised society. Do the people running this show and, and controlling us mind my cartoons? Do, you know, do, do they, um, are they affected by them in any way? Do, do they dread my cartoons coming out? That, that was a question that was relevant before any of this started as well. You know, how much impact do you actually have? Um, it's not very clear. I've heard from people that, you know, um, advisors in Parliament, people who work with MPs, that they will often open the papers and look at the cartoons and show them, or sometimes not show them if they think it's uh, too much, if it's going to upset them. I, I don't necessarily think I'm motivated by, by, by the idea that, that I'm going to get through to the politicians, to the people in charge. Um, and for the last 20 months, what I've tried to do is produce counter-propaganda that's aimed at the population, not at the politicians. I fully accept that everything I've done could, could not affect those making the rules in any way whatsoever. Um, but my hope is that maybe I can make members of the public think again, just pause and consider the situation in a different way. It's difficult to know actually whether, how much my personal situation and experience have influenced my stance on all of this, because I'd like to think I would have been opposed to it regardless. But definitely what I've been through uh, and my experience as a parent, I, I think has made it all clearer to me and made me fight harder against it. Um, I, I think if it wasn't for my personal situation, perhaps I, I'd have given up or, or um, not sacrificed as much as I have at this point. Um, this, what's going on is, it really, it all comes down to the balance that we all have to strike collectively and individually between fear and risk and love and freedom. Um, we all as individuals and as societies have to carve out that line somewhere in the middle and we can stray a bit either way. It seems to me like what's happened is We've been told by scientists and politicians that actually the two things that matter are risk and fear and that love and freedom are um, conditional extras, luxuries to be enjoyed when they tell us we can. Now, um, when, when I became a parent eight years ago, uh, my daughter was born with brain damage, um, so she has cerebral palsy and epilepsy. And as a result, she is very vulnerable. She's at risk. Funnily enough, she, because of her epilepsy, she's at risk from all respiratory viruses. So her seizures are triggered by any cold anytime she gets ill. And any one of her seizures could be potentially fatal. Um, and in her early years, on several occasions, they almost were. You know, and I had to, at one, at one point, um, get used to, well, you never get used to it, but on a regular basis, uh, I'd be rushing to hospital in an ambulance with her moments away from death. Now, when you're thrust into becoming a parent with that situation, it forces you to confront some very difficult realities. Instinctively, every fiber of your being wants to keep your child safe and protect them from things that, that could harm them, anything that presents a risk. But you gradually come to understand, you have to understand that every single thing you do to alleviate risk also restricts their freedom. There is a fine line between protecting somebody you love and oppressing them. I think um, you know, there are almost infinite things my wife and I could do to protect our daughter. Uh, every one of them takes away their freedom. 
if we want to love her fully as parents, we have to allow her some independence. We have to allow her some sense of adventure, spontaneity, joy. Or we're not allowing her to live. And I think understanding that is what really has influenced my whole view on all of this because um, you can't have freedom without risk. That's the deal. You can't escape that. You know, to exist in the world as a human being, as a free human being, is to be at risk and to put others at risk to varying degrees all the time. And so it's about a balance. And we are going down a road where we're throwing that balance out the window. We're getting it wrong. And that's very dangerous because the, the other side will often try and make out that, that freedom and care are in opposition to each other, right? So freedom is an entirely selfish thing that, that people want for their own gain. Um, that's not true at all. You, freedom is essential if you want to care for other people. And if you love somebody, part of that is giving them their freedom and their dignity. So this idea that, that freedom is bad and alleviation of risk is, is, is all that's important um, and, and fear, we should all be ruled by fear. It's a toxic idea to me. You know? And that's another thing I realized becoming a parent and going through all of that. It's incredibly frightening being in those situations, having to face that reality. And it almost destroyed me. You realize that if I let it, this fear will infect me completely. It will take over my life. It will rule everything I do. Uh, you've got to dominate the fear. You can't let it be in control. And everybody seems to have surrendered to it. That's dangerous. For us as a family, it was difficult, obviously, dealing with the situation we already had. Um, and, you know, our daughter has a lot of additional needs. She uh, needs regular appointments, therapies, um, medication, equipment, and it was all harder to obtain. Um, and I've, I've made a public statement about how hard it was, but something I would like to stress is that in many ways, we're luckier than a lot of families. You know, we, have a good income, or we did have before I lost my job. Um, we have a big house in the countryside. We've got a support network. There are other people who've been in that same situation who don't have those things. They're stuck in a small flat on their own. Um, and it would have been hell for them. And the reason I, I reluctantly shared my personal situation, because I deliberately hadn't for a long time, because I thought, shouldn't be necessary, you know. Now I'm arguing on moral principles. I shouldn't need to add my own experience to, to legitimize those. But the main reason I decided to was to try and give a voice to all those other people. There are thousands of families around the country who've suffered in the same way we have or worse. And the point is they don't have a voice. They don't have a platform. No one is listening to them. And I wanted to try and raise awareness of this issue and maybe encourage them to come out and say, yeah, you know what, we've suffered as well through this. My view on Twitter and social media more generally is that by and large, it's a very bad thing. And we'd all be a lot better off if it had never been invented. Um, and my approach to using Twitter before all of this started was to just put my cartoons on there and nothing else. I didn't want to reveal anything about myself. I didn't want to add any opinions or comment further on what was going on. Um, but early on in this, I realized there weren't enough people with large following saying what I felt needed to be said. So I started to um, tweet my views and, and write threads and um, comment on what politicians were saying in addition to my cartoons. And it's, it's, um, it's difficult. It's, it's designed, we know that it's designed to be addictive. We know it's designed to 
create division and argument. That's what the people who run it want. It's extremely toxic. At the same time, uh, I've obviously built up a massive following on Twitter through uh, what I've said over the past 20 months. And there is information being shared on there that you won't find anywhere else that's important. Um, that, that, that is the truth about what's actually happening. Um, I don't know, I, obviously my, <laughs> my Twitter career resulted in me losing my job ultimately. Um, that was over some tweets and going forward, I don't know if I, if I am going to change my approach to Twitter or not. I haven't decided yet. It's very difficult to know. As I said, I never expected to be an outlier in any of this. I never thought that I would be one of this very small group who were speaking out and, and saying, uh, saying that it was wrong and it needed to stop. And I'm still surprised that there are so few of us. Um, and as a result, I mean, yeah, I've had a lot of people getting in touch, sending messages, sending emails. It's very, very humbling. Um, because on the one hand, you feel this massive weight of responsibility that you are speaking for all of these people and um, trying to fight on, on their behalf. On the other hand, you realize that, you know, I mean, some, some people have been through such horrendous things and they'll get in touch and, and tell you about it and you just don't know what to say. You don't even know where to begin. Um, but, you know, it's, it, that's kept me going. That, that's kept me going for sure. The cartoons I've done have shifted quite dramatically in tone and message um, over the past 18 months. And I have um, certainly felt a need to escalate what I'm saying and the images I'm creating as the situation has gone on. It's another thing that's frustrated me about the media where they will, they, they, they have this reluctance to move to the next stage. They'll say something is absolutely wrong. It will continue happening for six months and six months later they will just publish the same article saying this can't be allowed to continue. Whereas I felt like, no, that this is, they're upping their game. They, they are increasing their tyranny and their totally unjustifiable measures. So we should do the same. And so um, my work ended up becoming, some of it becoming a lot more serious, a lot darker. And that, some of that has been the most popular. And actually a lot of that stuff was, was um, work I did independently, so not things that were published by the paper. Um, my most well-known or, or possibly the, the piece that's had the most impact is probably the um, Stan Firm piece with the demon stood in front of the mother with her child uh, holding a syringe. And it was um, the fastest cartoon I've ever done. Didn't really think about it. I didn't plan it. I just sat down and I did it in uh, two or three hours. Um, I think it was just pure emotion, desperation. And I just let it pour out onto the page. And what's interesting about that is it's, it's, it's very dark and quite extreme. But I was sort of trying to do two things at the same time. I wanted to frighten people. Um, about what was happening because I think people should be afraid but at the same time the message was an optimistic one it was a positive one it was you know stay strong uh, you can stand against this and you should and if you do it will be okay and um, I think maybe it's that juxtaposition of be afraid but be brave and you can get through this that that maybe makes it work um i don't know because i didn't 
planet. So it's one of those weird things where I, I don't quite know where it came from. And then the other one that's probably resonated the most, which is the other end of the scale in terms of tone, is the um, couple sitting on the hill uh, with the message, never surrender your right to be with the people you love. And I almost didn't do that one because I thought this is too obvious. This message is just a given. Everybody knows this. And then I realized we'd reached a point somehow where it was controversial to say that. Um, and the responses, the negative responses to that from the other side, because I put that out, I think in September, 2020, and it was one of the things that made me realize just how serious the problem was for people who were in support of what was going on. Um, so many people saying, yeah, unless you're going to kill them, you know, unless you're going to give them a virus that kills them. And then you must, obviously you must surrender your right to be with them, which is so, it's such an odd argument because Nowhere in that sentiment am I saying surrender your right not to be with the people you love. No one has ever suggested that Chris Whitty should go around to people's houses and force them to go and visit their elderly relatives if they don't want to. That's not the point. If you agree with the people you love that actually you're all scared of the virus and you don't want to take the risk, don't see each other. That's fine. But the point is, it's up to families to decide, not the government. Um, that frightened me, actually, the number of people who didn't appear to be able to make that distinction. These, these things should be fundamental moral truths that we have in a free, civilised society. We're losing them. I mean, I find it ex really extraordinary that we've reached this point, where we are now, and there are still so many people calling for lockdowns, promoting lockdowns, or even talking about the first lockdown as a necessary evil or a mistake, something that was done in panic and we couldn't possibly have known what the consequences would be. Um, the point about lockdown, that this is what it all boils down to, and, and lots of people on our side don't acknowledge this enough, is that if you lock people in their homes, if you shut down frontline health care, if you um, introduce a situation where mental health goes through the roof, where you drive people to suicide, where you destroy their businesses, where you put them into extreme poverty, you make them homeless, you implement measures as a government, you take that direct action that does those things, it will kill people. It has killed people. It will go on killing people for the next 10, 20 years. Now, the government itself commissioned a report into the effects of the first lockdown, which said around 200,000 people could die over the following 10 years as a result of that first lockdown. It was on the front pages of the newspapers. It was on the front page of the Telegraph. That was later revised up to 500,000 people. And the way it was reported was to say, oh, uh, there's a chance that lockdown could kill more people than the virus. That was such an irresponsible way to report it. What they should have said was, our government is prepared to murder 200,000 people to control the spread of a respiratory virus. If they had reported it like that, if that had been the headline on BBC News, people would have woken up to what was going on. They would have said, this is wrong. But there's this idea that it's to do with a balance of numbers. Oh, well, as long as the virus kills more people, that's okay. It's not about numbers. This doesn't come down to numbers. Ethically speaking, what lockdown means is that your government is prepared to kill this group of people over here and it knows that they will die. Okay, you can't, this, these claims that, oh no, they couldn't possibly have known it's collateral damage, oh, it was an accident. No, they knew because they told us. 
We're going to murder these people over here because we think, we don't even know, it's a hunch, that this other group over here won't get a respiratory virus. If you have a society that accepts that at all, if you set that precedent, it's over morally for you. You cannot have a government that's able to do that because ethically speaking, it's no different from the government or the police or whoever it is going door to door, shooting people in the head and screaming, save the NHS. How many people who agree with lockdown would have been okay if that's what they did? There's, ethically, there's a massive difference between action and inaction. Not taking action and people dying from a virus is not the same thing as taking direct action to kill people because you think it will save others. You know, the, the, the second one is just not acceptable. You can't do it. You do everything else. If, if, even if you think it works and even if you think we might have to do it, you do everything else possible before you get to that point. You build nightingale hospitals, you use them, you triage people properly, you keep people with respiratory, respiratory symptoms out of hospital, you look at effective treatments, um, you build field hospitals, you use the army. 700,000 people volunteered to come out of retirement to help the NHS cope, not one was called up. Do all of that and if you've still got a problem, then you think about a lockdown. They went straight for lockdown. They went straight for killing people. Why? You know, what should have been a last resort has become a first response. It's absurd. Well, the sacrifice of children, um, not, not just in terms of children dying, but taking away their freedoms, their experiences, denying them their education, stopping them seeing their friends, making them afraid of something they don't need to be afraid of, making them feel guilty about deaths of old people, making them feel responsible for protecting their grandparents from catching a, a, a respiratory virus is, is absolutely disgusting. It's never justified. Um, in addition to that, what do we actually mean by saving lives? It, people get a bit confused about this. I mean, most people seem to talk about it now as if it's just the prevention of death but it does actually matter how old and ill the people are that you're trying to save. I often think it's more useful to talk in terms of giving life rather than saving it. How much life are we giving to this person if we prevent them from dying? The vast majority of people who are going to die from COVID-19 are not only very old, they're also very, very ill before they ever encounter the virus. They have an average of two serious underlying health conditions. Okay, so we're talking uh, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's. These are people at the end of their natural lives who are very, very ill. Therefore, any bacterial or viral infection is very likely to be that thing that, that gives them the final nudge of this mortal coil. It's always happened. That's part of the deal of getting old. People get old, they get ill and they die. Now, the idea that we've created a vaccine that's saved all these lives, a lot of what they mean is those people are no longer dying from COVID-19. But they were dying anyway. They're very old people who are going to be dying. Um, how much less likely are they to die having had the vaccine? Not, not very less likely at all. Whereas children sh are not supposed to die. You know, they have, a, a five-year-old has 80 years of life, potentially. If you stop that five-year-old from dying, you are giving them 80 years of life. If you stop a 90-year-old with cancer, Alzheimer's and heart disease from dying, how much life are you giving them? Not very much. And we, you cannot have a society that thinks in this way. Um, that places this onus on protecting the lives of the old and the frail at the expense of the young. And one of the things that's so depressing is that not enough people in that generation 
who we're doing all of this for have stood up and said, don't do this, don't do this in my name, don't do I'm not having my grandchildren lose out because of me. I can remember growing up, um, you know, with elderly grandparents, if we were supposed to see them or something. If someone in the family is ill or has a bug, you'd often call them and, and, and say, oh, by the way, um, I've got a cold, got a nasty, got, I think I've got flu. You might not want to see us. You know, that's how it works. That's, that's how it used to work. And very often they would say, I don't care about that. I want to see you. I don't mind. I've got long, long left anyway, you know. Because when you get to that stage in life, what matters to you? Seeing your family, seeing your children and your grandchildren. Not just prolonging your days, obsessing over pure existence. That's, that's not life, it's not living. In many ways, the abandonment of religion hasn't helped because whatever you think about Christianity or organized religion, it, it, at the very least, it allows a framework and a space to talk openly about death and to accept the inevitability of death. And the, one of the main aims of it is to remove the fear of death. And in some ways it doesn't matter whether what it says is even true. We can't live our lives obsessed with the idea that we're going to die and terrified of it. And to a large extent, children need to be protected from the reality of death. They certainly shouldn't be made to feel responsible for the deaths of adults. There are no circumstances in which that's okay. We, we pass viruses around and old people get them and they might die. Um, the thing that's changed is that suddenly people are suggesting that they're going to tell their children it was their fault. What, what kind of sick parents are they? I, you know, I've had those comments on, on some of my cartoons. One of the ones I did with the old lady hugging her granddaughter and it, and it said, um, some risks are always worth taking. And again, those of the comments was, well, she, the, the little girl isn't going to think that at her funeral when her mother's telling her that she's killed her grandmother. And you think, who is that mother? Who is that parent? You don't tell children those things because it doesn't make sense anyway, you know. Um, that, that love, to love an old person, uh, to hug them, the, you know, pe people at that stage in life, they know they're at risk, they know they're vulnerable. And they know it's either see their grandchildren or, or live in a box for the last 10 years of their life. You know, they don't want to do that. Um, children are now being made aware of things they should never be made aware of. And the damage is already done, even just masks. Masks shouldn't be worn around children. They certainly shouldn't be put on children. The psychological damage that has done that we may never undo. I try and avoid my children being around anyone in a mask. I certainly wouldn't ever let them have a mask put on them. But even just seeing people walking around in masks, I know it's disturbing for, for them. It's disturbing for all of us. Some of us just don't want to admit it. Some people will be aware that I lost my job at The Telegraph as a result of some tweets I sent to Rachel Clark on Twitter. Uh, who is a doctor, some people may not be aware of her. If you're not on Twitter, you probably haven't heard of her. Um, she's a palliative care doctor. She's also a journalist and um, she has a book coming out about the pandemic. And she, is, uh, she has um, 250,000 followers and she has been a relentless supporter of government measures um, her only criticism of the government has been they haven't done enough, they haven't gone far enough. And for the last few months, she's been calling for another lockdown. Now, she's by no means the worst character. There are, there are people who are more 
aggressive um, in their views than she is. She is one of several people who have a public platform who have been calling for this stuff since the beginning, refusing to acknowledge the harms that have been caused or, or address the moral issue at all. And I, knowing myself how disgustingly immoral it all is and how unnecessary it is and how the, the evidence is clear that it doesn't, doesn't appear to work any of this stuff, I, I feel like they need to at least acknowledge some responsibility or have some awareness that, that they have caused harm to a certain group of people. And what happened with, with me was that I was responding to a comment from her that she had received verbal abuse. Um, now, without going into the details of what happened with her, that's happened a lot lately, that people who've advocated all of this stuff, high-profile people, have taken to social media or written articles whinging about the fact that members of the public have been mean to them. Now, if you're out in public, if you're Chris Whitty or Patrick Vallance or Boris Johnson or Matt Hancock, you must be aware that some of the people around you have had their lives destroyed by the measures you have implemented. People have lost businesses, they've lost their homes, their marriages have been destroyed, people's children have died, people have lost babies. I think the least these people should expect is some mean words shouted at them, perhaps. But to take to social media or to write a column saying this is unacceptable, I'm not having this, I just, I find that disgusting. I think that that is dangerous. These people have to take some responsibility for what they have done. Now the thing about Twitter particularly it is um, it, it makes you angry and I've been very angry for a very long time now because of what's going on. And anger can get the better of you. It, it can make you say things that you regret. It, it can make you go too far. Um, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you're angry and you don't pause and just think about what you're going to say. Um, I got angry and I tweeted something. I stand by the sentiment of what I said. Uh, I regret the way I said it, perhaps. Um, my life would be easier if I'd never seen that tweet from her, if I'd never responded to it. I made an apology trying to contextualize why I said that and why I hold the views that I do. The upshot is I've lost my job. I've lost my financial security. Many will think I deserved it. Many have told me I deserved it. Um, many have said I didn't. I have to focus on keep the fight, to keep fighting the fight and, and um, take this as an opportunity to do more, which I think it could be. Um, yeah, part of me is sad to have left the Telegraph. I was there for 10 years. There's some brilliant people there that I worked with. Um, and you know, what happened between me and the company is, uh, I don't want to talk too much about that. People can decide for themselves. They, they know more or less what's happened. Um, history will judge ultimately, you know, either, either this thing goes on, it runs its course and, and we live the rest of our lives in a dystopian hellscape or people start to understand what's actually gone on and and the things we've said the actions we've taken may be seen in a different light i don't know i'm not i don't claim that i've done everything perfectly i've, I've made mistakes i've gone too far 
Um, my biggest fear in many ways is that I don't want to get to the end of my life and have to look my children in the eye and say, I just didn't bother. I just sat that one out because I didn't think I could do anything. Um, at least I've tried. I'm quite optimistic about the future. Uh, I think, I hope that now I'm going to have a lot more freedom than I had before. Um, that's not really a criticism of, of the Telegraph, it's just if you're not attached to a newspaper, if you're not attached to a big corporation, you just aren't constrained in the same way. Um, so working without as much editorial input is exciting for me. It's a bit daunting because obviously I've had 10 years of working in that way. Um, but I'm really excited and I think what I'm really keen to do is try and cover what's going on all over the world, not just domestically, because there's so much going on in other countries that doesn't get covered in our media, obviously. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know whether I'm still a political cartoonist or a newspaper cartoonist. Maybe I'm something different now. Maybe I've become something different by accident through what's happened over the past 20 months. I don't know if I describe myself in that way anymore, but uh, I'm reluctant to call myself an artist. Um, that feels far too grand to me, but uh, I'm just going to try and stay true to myself, true to my message and, and keep putting things out. This is one of the big questions, isn't it? Will, will they overreach themselves? Will they overplay their hand? Somebody said to me near the beginning that um, the thing about mass psychosis, which I think is a big part of this, is that the human brain cannot sustain psychotic ideas for more than a certain amount of time. Eventually, it, it, because it's exhausting, it's exhausting to hold these nonsensical ideas and perform this theatre for so long. Eventually your brain just says no and pushes it out can't can't do it again it's sort of there's a natural breakdown in it um i'd have thought that would have happened by now <laughs> but the worry is that if this is an agenda and that's something else i wanted to talk about actually um because we know this is wrong because we've known it's wrong for such a long time naturally we not only oppose it and say it needs to stop, but we start trying to figure out exactly what is going on. And I think it's entirely healthy and understandable that, that we explore all lines of inquiry. We're open to any possibilities. And inevitably you come across various theories, conspiracy theories, um, things that might be going on behind the received narrative. But a point I really want to stress is that you don't need to have read or believed a single conspiracy anywhere online to be against all of this. On the face of it alone, just on the morality of it, just on the logic, just on the instinct you should feel as a human being, it's wrong. And there's this idea on the other side that often gets thrown at this, this assumption that you would have been okay with it if you hadn't watched that video on YouTube. And now you suddenly think Bill Gates has, has put the internet in your brain. It's not that. This is, none, all of that is interesting and there's a place for it. And part of the problem is that we can't stop this happening unless we understand what it actually is. So it's perfectly reasonable to try and establish what it actually is. Is it incompetence? Is it governments copying each other? Is it a conspiracy? Is it an agenda? Um, but to be against it and to want it to stop and to want to ensure it never happens again, none of that is necessary. Now, if it is an agenda, if this is something they're pushing, if they're genuinely trying to change what humanity is forever, 
will they take it to a certain point and then just give up if there's resistance or have they planned for that how extreme will they become they they must if it's a plan they must have bargained on the fact that people might wake up and fight back the worrying thing is what are they going to be prepared to do when that happens i think several other people have said this that if there are people behind all of this they're evil and evil is predominantly cowardly and when evil meets with genuine uh, bravery and people fight back it tends to just crumble and so i think we should all remain hopeful and optimistic that we'll win yeah.